So what is the Ontario Tourism Marketing Partnership Corporation anyway? It's the agency of the Government of Ontario that's mandated to promote tourism within the province and from all the countries of the world. No small mandate. Our strategic directions, uh, while we're trying to make Ontario a preferred destination, are to build and deliver the case for investment. Museums are tourism assets. They need investment. Um, recently, I was at the uh, Small Museum in Pembroke and the Black History Museum in Amherstburg, and uh, I concur with that. But as a Government of Ontario official, I probably shouldn't say that too much. We believe we need to create a powerful brand that drives results. How do we make Ontario stand out worldwide? Why would anyone get on a plane and fly 13 hours, like I just did from Shanghai, to come to Ontario for a vacation? I'm going to uh, talk to you about that a little bit. We actually have partnership strategies, and museums and art galleries are already partners with us in many ways. I'm going to talk about that. And of course, we're committed to organizational innovation and effectiveness internally. Let's talk about visitation to Ontario. 83% of tourism in Ontario emanates from visits by our own Ontario people. Uh, that only results in 57% of the money that is spent on tourism, because the average spend by an Ontario tourist is about $73. 11% of visitation from the United States results in 18% of the spend, and 1.9% of the visitation from overseas visitors results in 15% of the spend. So basically, 33% of the expenditures in tourism by tourists happens from people who are not from our country. What's important about this is we don't want to reduce the number of Ontarians who appreciate the museums, but we would love to increase the percentage of visitors from other places who experience museums. Two years ago, with the regional, Ontario also has 13 regional tourism organizations, and the government of Ontario gives them 40 million a year, of which 20 million is for marketing, mostly within Ontario. Toronto, Ottawa, and Niagara Falls in the north go into the United States. Our agency gets another 40 million from the government of Ontario. Together, that's 80. With the regional tourism organizations last year, we invested in a $2 million research project. We looked at visitors from all over Ontario, Quebec, Manitoba, and 21 states in the United States. So this is basically the northeastern corridor of visitation. And we discovered that the top four consumer segments in terms of visitor are not the same as the top four in terms of expenditure. And what we're doing with our marketing strategy is focusing on the money, if you will. We're going to follow the money. A regional tourism organization like RTO1, which includes uh, Windsor, cares a lot about aces. Aces are people who gamble, and they don't do much else. The four consumer segments that are utmost interest to us are knowledge seekers, up-and-coming explorers, connected explorers, and family memory builders. But I'm going to talk today to you about just two of them, and really about one of them knowledge seekers and up-and-coming explorers, because that, that volume of tourists really cares about museums. Now, this database is available for additional mining, and Marie and I have talked about the fact that you, the Museums Association may wish to find resources in order to analyze the data much deeper. So today, I'm giving you what's sort of available at the highest level. Each regional tourism organization has its own four priorities. So if you go to the north, for example, nature lovers are going to be a larger percentage. Who are the knowledge seekers? Well, this one's really easy for me because I am one. We did a couple of workshops uh, among the OTMP staff, HC staff trying to understand who these customers are and what they're like. And oh my god, I am so much a knowledge seeker. It's like I'm a Taurus and the Chinese calendar, I'm an ox. So I'm a double bull who really loves to go to museums and art galleries and the performing arts. And I'm going to give you lots of data about this. But if you look at the word cloud on the bottom right, the people in this category are baby boomers who want to rediscover the world. And they really appreciate um, their ability to understand cultures. The connected explorers are slightly younger. But they also want to share stories, and they're engaged. And they want to experience things a little bit more. 
And what's different about them is that they are totally technology driven. They are so mobile it's ridiculous. I'm not one of those. So I'm going to talk to you about the knowledge seekers. 70% of the visitors, they're looking to appreciate and understand the places they visit. They want to expand their knowledge and stimulate their minds. I don't go anywhere that I travel, and I've traveled to, I just did another calculation, 79 cities in 23 countries without going to museums. It's on my must list. But you have to ask yourself, is your museum a trip motivator or a trip enhancer? And most regional and community museums are trip enhancers. I don't necessarily go to that particular destination to see the museum. But when I go to the destination, I will go to the museum. So 93% of knowledge seekers visited museums and places of interest in a, in a similar vein. We want to explore and learn. We're seeking knowledge and uh, we call ourselves knowledge seekers. Our average household income is more than 100,000. Our travel budget's just under 5,000 a year. Um, when we retire, that may be adjusted slightly. The average number of trips in the past 12 months, those could be two local and one longer distance trip. Eight days in average, usually two people, maybe a third party, and the average spend per person is $1,300. Because you work in museums, you may recognize yourselves in some of these statistics. Because we're knowledge seekers and not connected explorers, 77% of us are still reading the newspaper and 68% of us still want to turn the page. I have a master's in Shakespeare. I like the book. I don't want to read a Kobo or a tablet. And I'm surrounded at work by young people who are just consumed by tablets and Kobos and all of those kinds of things. That's a different customer. So if you want me to come to your museum, I care about your signage. And if I'm a foreign tourist, I care about your multilingual signage, but I'll come back to that. But over on the right, 90% are using the internet, 81% are using search engines. So your search engine marketing is absolutely essential to people finding the museum. If I'm going to Pembroke and I don't have access to a lot of brochures because I'm there at 8 o'clock in the morning before anything is open, I could go on my, on, to Google on my BlackBerry, which is a government issue. That's why I have a BlackBerry and not an Ivo. Um, I will be able to find the museum if you have a website. The age is 55 or older. I qualify. Couple with no children or single with no children. That doesn't mean they never had children. It means the children aren't with them, living with them at the moment. And 32% are retired. I find this statistic interesting because it doesn't fit my profile. I like to take my time at historical sites of museums, 38%. So if so many of them want to go to historical sites and museums, and only 38% of those want to take their time, that may speak to the ability to rent the earphones and the headphones and all of those kinds of things. I'm a museum goer who wants to go through and I find the discovery items that make me want to stop. And that could be just about anything. In the Pembroke Museum, there were ancient, well, ancient things from the 1800s. I've been to the Acropolis, not so ancient. But there were lots of really old and interesting things. And then you find things from your childhood. A very odd one in Fort St. John. I went to a museum that had the grade five classroom from the year I was in grade five. I, I went from feeling OK to feeling ancient. but. That there are customers who want to take time and there are customers who want highlights. Well, on an overnight trip in the past year, 53% of knowledge seekers and 45% of connected explorers actually visited a museum. So this database, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time with more of it because we haven't mined it exclusively for museums, I think would be worth mining to get more data and to provide your members with more information about the museum goer. 2,069,000 responses. That's a huge amount of data. And it is um, de-aggregatable, I guess you could say, by individual regions. So if you're from um, RTO 13, if you're from the north or you're from uh, north of Ottawa or you're from the Thousand Islands or you're from London, Ontario, you'll be able to get data that is relevant uh, to the postal codes that uh, drive you a local audience, as well as information internationally. 
I want to move now to foreign visitation. This chart shows you the percentage growth of visitation from various countries and the volume of visitation uh, from various countries. So after Ontario and the United States, so tourism is a $23 billion industry, 300,000 jobs, um, but the largest volume of visitors after Ontario and the United States is the United Kingdom. But China, which when this slide was done, showed an acceleration that is absolutely enormous, has now passed. So you could take that little flag of China and move it to the right. It is now past France and Germany in volume. And we expect in three to five years, according to the Canadian, Tour Canadian Tourism Commission, that it will pass the United Kingdom. China has a population, I was just there for two and a half weeks, 40 times the population of Canada. You cannot imagine. I went to Shanghai, Shenyang, Chengdu, Hangzhou, Beijing, and Guangzhou. All the cities are bigger than Toronto. Many of them are 20 million. They all have incredible subway systems. There are rapid trains between uh, uh, cities like Hangzhou to uh, Guangzhou. We don't have the public transportation infrastructure we need to actually move the volumes of people around that we might want to. Why do I mention this? Because every museum I go to in China, I can hear everything in Mandarin and English. How many of you do not have sound systems that provide Chinese customers with information? When I go to Italy, I see signs in Italian and English. Countries that are at the forefront of tourism, because China is now the number one source of outbound tourists in the world, are looking for ways to accommodate the Chinese tourist. 96% growth is projected between 2010 and 2014. India, 40% growth is projected. Europe, the economy remains flat. The Germans still come, but they don't want to go to the cities. They want to go out into nature. The people from England are still coming, but the growth is not there. The growth is in India, China, emerging markets. Brazil is going to grow more quickly, and so will Mexico, if we remove the visa requirement. And the Brazilian Tourism Association I had dinner with in the summer, they were saying we're not coming for the Pan Am Games because we're going to the Olympics and the World Cup. But we're curious about snow and cold. But they really want to shop. The average spend per visitor from Brazil is the highest at $1,800 per visitor after airfare, of course. At OTMPC, we're using this research information. Oh, by the way, we went around to 11 countries and asked people, another research project, um, what do you know about Ontario? They didn't know the word. They'd never heard the word. What do you know about Canada? Four words come to mind. Niagara Falls, Toronto, Rocky Mountains, and Vancouver, in that order. So we debate with the Canadian Tourism Commission sometimes the preponderance of Wales and Rocky Mountains that are in their advertising for Canada and suggest that urban experiences like Toronto might be more relevant. So we're focusing our investment in marketing on Ontario and Quebec in Canada. We did research in Alberta and uh, British Columbia and they said we're not coming. We don't want to spend the amount of money it costs me to fly from Calgary or Vancouver to Toronto when I can go to California and Hawaii for the same amount of money. So yes, we're going to look at them for, through media relations, but in terms of advertising investment, we won't get a return on investment. In the United States, we know that New York, Michigan, and Pennsylvania have a lot to offer. Some people say, why Pennsylvania? It's because if I buy media in New York, I get a spillover in uh, Pennsylvania, and so that's worth it. And then for the first time ever, China's going to get brand advertising. I'll come back to that. We partner with the Canadian Tourism Commission. We train travel agents. I was just part of a mission that trained almost 200 travel agents about Ontario. Ontario made a presentation. I didn't do it in Mandarin. I did a, a few words. But we had a person presenting in Mandarin about Ontario. And then Toronto, Ottawa, and Niagara Falls made presentations. And they talked about museums. And they talked about restaurants and the things you can do. And we found out in China that the customer that drives by and waves from a bus is being diminished by the outbound travel agencies because the new Chinese tourist is 30 to 45 years old, a young professional who has money but wants to do things. One of them said, they dragged me all the way up to Algonquin Park to look at a tree. 
And what a waste of time. And we said, well, did they invite you to go kayaking or canoeing? I would have loved to do that. So what is the experience like in museums? I know from my, my work at the Canada Council on Canadian Heritage in the 80s, I actually worked with the Canadian Museums Association on a project. Um, I know that museums have been trying to go from just exhibit to also the experience of the exhibit in a very strong way. And I think sometimes it's been very successful. That's what these tourists want to do. Brazil, Germany, France, India. In terms of Mexico and South Korea, they're not growing very quickly, so we're going to focus only through media relations. But the power of media relations is quite significant. We um, got 16 million impressions in the first quarter and 22 million impressions in the second quarter from our media relations activities. And that's um, using a $1 to $1 advertising equivalency. We're not multiplying. The research that we did internationally gave us what we call a new brand essence. It's not the actual marketing slogan. It's called surprising contrast. The Canadian Tourism Commission talks about vibrant cities close to nature. What this research revealed to us is the ideal vacation for the international tourist is a balance between exciting, interesting things to do and rest and relaxation in a safe place. Ontario has that. And if you think about it, thanks to Porter and Air Canada, you can either fly or drive two hours and visit anywhere in Ontario. I can get to Sudbury and uh, Fort William and Thunder Bay um, within two hours. I can drive two hours and get all the way to Muskoka. That's a very significant thing to have that much access. What we have to do is make Ontario as a destination the only place you want to go. So it's not Niagara Falls, Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal, Quebec with apologies to Quebec, my mother was a Quebecer, I speak French, we want them to stay in Ontario. I mentioned a bit about the Chinese tourist and uh, multilingual signage opportunities, and that's a picture of my colleague Lisa Lavecki and I. We actually got to pet a three-year-old panda. However, I learned you do not put your hand heavily on the panda's shoulder because the two or three-inch claws come out and he turns his head very quickly, and the guy in charge gets very upset. What we did to try and encourage um, tourists from China to come is invest over $900,000 in a microfilm. This is a new approach to things. It costs way too much money, like $3 million, to have a television commercial in Shanghai, Beijing, and Guangzhou. Instead, for the amount of money we invested, and thank you very much to Ottawa Tourism, Tourism Toronto, Niagara Parks, and Air Canada for money, we created a 30-minute movie, it's actually now 45, that will be entered in the Chinese Microfilm Festival. It will be seen by several hundred million people on 481 television channels in March. Somehow the guy in the movie canoes from Ottawa to Niagara Falls and canoes from <laughs> near Niagara Falls to Toronto, but it's a movie, right? Um, but he goes into the Royal Ontario Museum to find where the first elevator is in Canada, which turns out to be in um, the uh, Castle Loma. So there is a bit of a museum content to this 46-minute movie. I'm going to move now to, yes, we do partner with people, and yes, we have money to co-invest in projects. A couple of years ago, when I first got to OTMPC, one of our colleagues, the Art Gallery of Ontario, was selling the Chagall exhibit. And they wanted to sell it to rich Jewish people. Are they here? Is the Art Gallery of Ontario a member? Yes. Are they here? Because I'm probably telling a state secret. They were, they were selling the Chagall exhibit to uh, rich Jewish people in Montreal and border cities in the United States. And I said, what? Rich Jewish people live in New York City. So we said, we'll give you the money that you asked for, a portion of it, but we'll bonus it, which we've never done before, if you also go to New York City in our Condé Nast program at the time. And they did, and it was so successful that they repeated it later for another exhibit. So we have two programs, and they're being revised, and I don't know how many of you know about them, but the Tourism Events Marketing Program is about Ontario-based public tourism events. 
So a museum wouldn't be eligible for money, but a particular exhibit could be, right? A, a major uh, exhibit. It's for the placement of paid advertising, translation costs, billboard space purchase, email list, digital advertising, very specific. It'll provide funding up to 75% of eligible Ontario targeted marketing costs to a maximum of 20,000 per event and funding of up to 150,000 for campaigns targeting out of province consumers with our contribution not exceeding 50% of the out of province marketing costs. We mostly give this money to 120 festivals in the province, but there are exhibits that are events that I think would also qualify. The other program is a bigger picture program. The Tourism Industry Partners Program is now going to be exclusively out of province. It's going to promote Ontario, Quebec, Manitoba, states close by, Europe, Asia, you choose. In the past, we would invite people to buy an ad in our magazine. We're not doing one magazine anymore, if you haven't heard. We're going to do four inserts. And instead of distributing the magazine to 400,000 people in Ontario, we're going to do the four inserts to 1.3 million in Ontario and the United States. And am I here to ask you to buy an ad? Well, maybe. <laughs> However, this is different. This is, you tell us what your big idea is, and we collaborate with your big idea. The budget for this program used to be $300,000. It's going to be over a million next year. We've moved money out of other things so that we can be a responsive tourism marketing organization working with you. And you see the things that qualify, and we will provide funding of up to 40% of the eligible project costs to a maximum of 200,000 for approved projects. One of the things we don't want this program to become is five and $10,000 here, there, and everywhere. This is for the big guys. The other program is more for um, smaller museums, or this is for a group of museums. So you could take all the museums in a regional tourism organization and say, we want to profile all the museums in southwestern Ontario, or all the museums in southeastern Ontario to people who live in Rochester, Syracuse, Buffalo, and, and Detroit, or something like that. We, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Canadian Tourism Commission's Signature Experiences Program. Some of you are. The Canadian Tourism Commission created a, um, what would you call it, sort of an inventory of the most unique, most wonderful things that a person should do uh, in uh, the country. Ontar Ontario didn't apply very much. British Columbia and Alberta have way more of these signature experiences. And now the CTC is marketing the signature experiences uh, internationally. We decided that to encourage Ontarians to be involved, we'd create an Ontario Signature Experiences Program. The 30-some uh, Canadian Tourism Commission Signature Experiences Program will be grandfathered into our program. But we're looking for something that is unique and incredible. So the Diefenbunker, for example, is a CTC signature experience. Niagara Falls is not a signature experience. A helicopter flying over Niagara Falls and landing in a winery where people can do wine tasting is a signature experience. So if you want to apply to this, you have to think about what makes your museum different from anything else in the entire world. And here's the list of criteria. Most of it is you have to have a website, you have to be legal, and so on. But you have to be committed to really marketing yourself as a unique and incredible experience. Moving forward, OTMPC is trying to build a powerful brand for Ontario, Canada that gets results. Our objective is to work with partners, and I think museums are partners and can continue to be partners. And yes, we want to increase visitation, but more importantly, we want to increase spend. Bringing new money into the economy is what will grow prosperity in Ontario. How are we going to do that? We're going to create a brand story with an emotional connection. Instill pride of place for people who are from Ontario. We're going to dare to curate Ontario. What are the iconic attractions? Now, I've mentioned a couple of small and a couple of large galleries. But if you were saying, I'm going to Greece, you'd say, I have to go to the Acropolis. If you were going to Florence, you have to go to the Uffizi. 
If you were going to Paris, you have to go to the Louvre. If you were going to Toronto, you have to go to the ROM and the AGO. Do you? Do we have that kind of reputation? Why not? I think we have the assets. I don't think we've promoted them enough as the one thing you have to do when you go. When you go to, to Amherstburg, do you have to go to the Black History Museum? I absolutely think you do. But how do we sell it so that everybody wants that to be the feeling that we all have about it? And how do we instill that desire in our children? So the, the family memory builder, which is one of the four uh, types, um, is a family-oriented uh, uh, consumer segment that I think could be very relevant as well to museums. Create motivating visuals. We have an image bank of 30,000 photographs. We think two-thirds of them are not worth keeping. From an archival point of view, you may choose to differ. From a marketing point of view, we know that they're not selling anymore. We've used the same photographs a lot. Last year, we invested a million dollars in new video and new photography from a new way of doing it. So instead of taking pictures that make it look like, oh, isn't that nice to look at, we're trying to capture the essence of doing. So if you're in the museum and you get to do something, or the children are making something, they're learning origami, I don't know, is there a way to illustrate the participation level of being in the museum? The look of interest and curiosity in somebody's face while they're looking at the exhibit instead of just showing me the exhibit. I'm thinking of the terracotta warriors at the ROM. I went and saw that incredible postcard they did and I walked in expecting to see at least 20 or 30 terracotta warriors and there were three, right? They got me in there, but I kind of went, oh. I needed a few more. They probably couldn't afford to bring a few more, I understand. But the picture they could have taken of a face looking at that terracotta warrior, and not just of the warrior, might have captured the essence of the curiosity and the knowledge seeker actually being satisfied. I mentioned we're going to focus on specific markets and prioritize consumer segments and continue to develop partnerships. So how are we going to do this? We're going to diversify the media mix. We're in all the media. The one thing we can't do much of is afford television. Right now, Brand USA is investing $40 million to get people in Canada to go to the United States. $20 million is focused in Ontario. The CTC is not in the United States, and I have $4.5 million to fight the $20 million from Brand USA. So we're in the social media. We're in media relations. We're trying to get free coverage everywhere we can. And yes, when I go to meetings with my government colleagues, I point out that it would be really nice to be able to afford television in New York and television in China. Motivating visuals I mentioned. We're investing a significant amount of money in www.ontariotravel.net. Do all of you know that you can, for free, upload information about your museum on ontariotravel.net? And if you do know that, I'm going to ask a question that I know the answer is not always yes to. How recently did you update that information? It's just one more source, and I know you have your own website. But people who want to travel in Ontario are getting a lot of motivation to look at this website from which they should link automatically to yours. We're going to celebrate the signature experiences. We're trying to work with the regional tourism organizations so that when we invest in media, putting our money together buys us uh, a better uh, product. Ontario Travel Information Centers. How many of you do not put your brochures in the Ontario Travel Information Centers? Nobody will admit to it or you're all doing it. That's good. The Travel Information Centers, yes, we closed seven. We still have 11. They're at the borders. And they do a really great job, and the average cost of serving a visitor in the travel center is $3.49. If they buy one ticket to an attraction or an entrance to a museum or an extra night in a hotel, that's a good investment. The microfilm project I mentioned, Aboriginal strategy. One of the members of our board is Chief Alan Luby from Kenora. And he said, what are you doing about Aboriginal tourism? And other than highlighting Turtle Island and a few Aboriginal experiences that exist in the province, we weren't doing a lot. So Bill Kenny, our VP Industry Relations, went to a Soyuz in the southern part of the Okanagan Valley. And we heard all about 
uh, BC and Tourism BC and what they're doing with the Aboriginal community to promote tourism. Our research says that the tourist will not come to Canada to experience Aboriginal culture, but they expect to come to Canada and have a two-hour, roughly, experience about Aboriginal culture. Not every community is close to Six Nations or close to an Aboriginal community. Do you have Aboriginal history and is it highlighted in your museum? We actually could be celebrating this and selling Ontario more effectively by highlighting our Aboriginal uh, museum heritage, shall I say. 2014 June, World Pride is coming. We expect to double, or world, I, we don't, Pride Toronto expects to double the audience from a million visitors to two million visitors, or participants. Many of them are from Ontario, many of them are from the United States. Do you have an exhibit that talks about lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgendered, queer culture? Have you even thought about that? And if you have a pride celebration in your community, have you thought about the opportunity to do something in the museum about the history of gay culture? Maybe controversial for some of your communities. Pan Am Games 2015. What are you doing in your museums to highlight the multicultural diversity of the province? I was the director of arts, cultural industries, and multiculturalism, including, including immigrant settlement in Saskatchewan for a few years. And I have a much greater appreciation for immigrant settlement and the challenges of immigrant settlement. And if newcomers to Canada, specifically Chinese and Indian, who have visiting friends and relatives, want to take them somewhere, they're going to want to take them somewhere where their contribution to Canada and to Ontario is being celebrated and highlighted and how much Eurocentricism is there in our collections versus globalism. I just made that up. Um, I'm posing a challenging question, but I think it's an interesting question. Maybe it's a personal and not a government of Ontario agency question. And then in 2017, of course, we get to celebrate the 150th anniversary of Canada and Ontario. That's a huge opportunity for museums to really rally around probably the cause among those three that is going to resonate the most with the knowledge seekers, the connected explorers, the family memory builders, and the up and coming explorers. And I imagine that you're all thinking about what you could do about the celebrating the history of Ontario. So I'm not sure um, from the technicians involved what I do now to, to actually make the video happen. But what we, d we thought we'd do, I'll end, and then I'll take any questions you may have, um, is to give you a short trailer for our Chinese microphone, which will just give you a bit of a flavor for it. Do I just press enter again? No. Nope. You can see I'm not a connected explorer. <laughs> I'm clearly a knowledge seeker. So can we get the video to play? Maybe. So simple, you see? Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Round of applause for this guy. <laughs> There you go. So um, the, the interesting thing about it, uh, I, w w when I was deciding to include it in this morning's presentation, it was never done with the point of view of celebrating Ontario's heritage. 
the, the 30-person crew that came from China had written their own script. We had approval. But basically, it's about a young man who wants to become a travel agent. In order to do that, he has to take um, pictures like in an amazing race. The first picture is to find a stable in Ontario. They love the jail hostel, which is, a, I guess, a historical site in Ottawa. We went through all kinds of, oh my God, should we be showing a jail to sell Ontario? We let them do what they wanted. Um, they, the, the stable in Ottawa is almost a historical site in, amongst itself or in a, for itself. Um, the the uh, choice of the powwow, same thing. So there's a whole lot of heritage stuff in this movie, but that they just wanted to tell the story of this guy doing an amazing race. He befriends a Canadian girl, played by a Mandarin-speaking Swedish girl, but if Emma Thompson can be American, we're okay with that. Other actors were Actra and Canadian and so on. And at the end of the movie, in the middle of the movie, she takes him an edge walk and he's afraid to go out and he doesn't go. At the end of the movie, whether or not he gets the job, it doesn't matter. He comes back to Ontario and goes out on edge walk and does that lean thing, which I, by the way, have been on edge walk, but I didn't lean out like that. I just <laughs> did there. Um, and we think it's going to, after it's shown across uh, China, make a lot more people want to come to Ontario. So that's my presentation. Thank you for having me.